So, industry applications beyond money. Can Bitcoin be used for more than just financial transactions? Can blockchain be used for more than just sending money around? Let's find out. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Sid Kala from Turing Group. Thanks, Eric. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Sweet. Um, okay, did you guys have a good time at the hackathon? Like the products are built? Yeah. yeah. Well, so I think there's a famous saying that you build the best products in a bear market. So I hope everyone's enjoying the 20, 2018 bear market right now, uh, more than you enjoyed 2017. Um, so today we'll talk about, let's take this application, like let's keep that speculation aside. Let's look at what this technology itself can enable. Um, and more importantly, let's also make sure that we're able to separate the hype from, from this whole industry in general. Um, I mean, yes, it's a new technology, and you know, we always have the so-called neomania, everything new is always exciting. Um, but at the same time, let's also keep track of you know, the industries we have built. There's a reason certain things work, what appear to be inefficient from the outside. Uh, so let's really dig down and let's look at the, the real kinds of innovation that are happening in the space. Um, and, and, and again, like, there definitely is a lot of potential beyond money. Uh, money is, as they say, just the first app of this technology. Uh, so let's explore that more in detail with our panel here. Uh, and, and I'll let the panelists introduce themselves as we go around. Uh, but while they do that, I would also like to lay out the lay of the land first. Um, <clears throat> I mean, as you all know, like Bitcoin was the first real application in the space. And it literally was like a peer-to-peer -peer electronic money as, as it was advertised back in the day. Uh, and of course, like things have changed. It's almost like 10 years now. Uh, but as you, uh, as you kind of extend into the industry, we are kind of seeing, again, a lot of different applications that may or may not really be blockchain. And that goes both for like your public blockchains, your private blockchains. Well, is a Tangle a blockchain? Well, I'm not sure. Is a DLT a blockchain? Uh, did and really start in the 70s as like a distributed database. Is that a blockchain? Not sure. Um, but I'll let the panelists actually take a quick look at like how they see the space. Like just very briefly, is it like Bitcoin cryptocurrencies or is it Bitcoin cryptocurrencies ICOs or where does private blockchain fit in? Uh, so just their understanding at a very high level, um, just the classifications of how they see the space and that will really help us kind of narrow down the discussion in a more focused manner. Uh, so I'll let, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves and kind of quickly give how they see the space. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Guy, uh, co-founder and CEO of Enigma. Uh, Enigma is uh, building a private smart contracts protocol. We call these uh, secret contracts. Essentially, it's the idea that you can actually run smart contracts uh, safely uh, and privately with, while hiding all of the information from the nodes which we believe is one of the most pressing issues in the space right now. Uh, it's actually good to be back. Uh, the project started here at MIT. Uh, it was my graduate thesis, uh, basically focusing on uh, decentralized uh, encrypted computation. So glad to be back on the expo. Uh, back to the question. So, you know, and this is, this is my philosophy. I've, I've never been able to separate too well the idea of a blockchain and a currency, to me, these two is like, you know, they, they kind of come together. They definitely come together in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other public networks um, in the sense that the token is really the thing or the, the coin is really the thing that incentivizes all the nodes to stay in line. Uh, that actually enables the kind of security and integrity that we can get with blockchains. Uh, that's, that said, I do... Fully, fully realize that there's a lot of place to um, introduce more uh, Byzantine fault tolerance inside uh, organizations. So private blockchains definitely have their space. Um, yeah, that's, that's the way I see it. Cool, thanks. Hi, I'm Jameson Lopp, and I've been engineering uh, Bitcoin wallets for about three years now. So uh, most of my expertise really lies in you know private key management, and you know from a wallet perspective, we can offer these services for any quote unquote uh, blockchain that is being uh, manipulated by the use of signatures from private keys. So. Uh, a wallet engineer can be pretty agnostic about the, the blockchains themselves and how they operate uh, from a like, governance perspective. But 
If we're talking about uh, money, then I think you know, money is a concept that is, is, is really this public thing that belongs to everyone. And so as a result, you want a monetary system to be open and public and available for anyone to contribute to it. Now, when we get beyond money, then we don't necessarily need the same type of, of contributors or governance or um, possibly even like censorship resistance. So it really comes down to a case by case basis of like, if we're using this blockchain as a new type of database, a new type of, of, of history of truth that we can go to without really requiring a trust in any specific entity, then what, what are the aspects of this system and, and the things that it's tracking? And what type of threat modeling do we need to have in place? What does it need to be resistant against and what does it need to be able to do? So that's when you start divvying up into public blockchains, private blockchains, permissioned, unpermissioned, and then it becomes even more complex when you actually start looking at the consensus algorithms and the governance aspects and what the distribution of power is in the system. So uh, it's a very diverse ecosystem already and I expect that it's going to continue to get weirder. Uh, I'm Bettina Warburg, uh, co-founder of Animal Ventures. We're a prototyping firm. Um, what gets us up in the morning every day is being able to experiment with our ideas at scale. Uh, so we do that primarily by partnering with Fortune 100 and at times government entities to really um, articulate a problem that exists in their core business or um, future business processes and then work from that problem through our own prototyping process and uh, doing our own research to actually think through what is the right business case and what are the opportunities for bringing in emerging technologies. So primarily for us, um, we work in the supply chain space with different uh, leaders in industries that have uh, significant supply chains. So you can think of pharmaceuticals or um, trucking and logistics or retail, where they're starting to see a whole revolution in um, different kinds of industry, Ford Auto, uh, technologies, so everything from additive manufacturing to IoT uh, to AI are all sort of swirling around as innovation um, tools within their supply chains already. And so what we help our clients do primarily is actually think about where and how blockchain can play a role in potentially unlocking some of those other technologies and uh, relate it to a core business problem. Um, so for us, there's a lot of experimentation uh, in play. It's a really great time to be doing experiments with uh, real world problems. It's a good place to start. Um, it does help you eliminate some use cases and think about what's possible down the road. But for us, uh, there's three main areas I would say that blockchains are playing a role. Uh, we're seeing them in provenance and just general sort of custodianship, track and trace of digital and physical objects. And we're seeing it in the automation of business logic, especially thinking about smart contracts applied to a supply chain that is essentially a string of contracts. And then um, in the third case, it's often around something we like to call compliance innovation. People don't usually like to talk about that, but it's actually a really important um, point, which is most supply chains uh, function in a very heavily regulated environment and across multiple jurisdictions. And so uh, being able to actually transact and be effective in those transactions and efficient in those transactions across that many partners who may or may not trust each other um, actually requires a lot of regulation. So being able to automate regulation and make things safer or more efficient is a, is a part of thinking about um, how you innovate in supply chain. So I'm happy to talk further about those projects as well. Cool. So hello. I am Antonio Tenorio, and uh, I am a PhD student at uh, Complutense University at Madrid. And I'm also a researcher and developer at uh, P2P Models, which is an European research project that will be developing tools for decentralizing uh, the sharing economy, the collaborative economy projects. 
Uh, we aim to uh, provide a decentralized infrastructure for these communities in order to enable uh, uh, the uh, democratic governance uh, of these projects and to facilitate uh, fair value distribution models. So we believe the blockchain may be used uh, for this kind of uh, use cases and not only for, for dealing uh, with money. And let's, uh, yeah. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks for all that uh, introduction. Um, so let, let's start this off with based off of where we stand as the state of the industry right now. Um, yes, like I think the money slash store of value application is pretty, I mean, of course, we have a long way to go, but that's kind of, we know how it works. But let's look at some applications that's outside of that realm. So I'll put that to the panelists. Like, are there any current applications that you see in the marketplace today? at already launched or close to launch that kind of excite you in terms of any applications for blockchains outside of money? So um, I think most of the applications we've seen for so far are actually not in blockchains, but are around the ecosystem for blockchains because we've really you know, created this new economy. Um, and the one thing that people need most is you know, ways to kind of interact with that economy. As to current applications that I think are exciting, I think that's still lacking. Uh, and I think we can you know, lay out the reasons why and what we are excited about. But I think we need to be very fair and admit that there are still some pretty big problems to solve. Uh, privacy, one of them, scalability is another. Uh, you, you know, I think the latest innovation we've seen is CryptoKitties. I don't know how many people are excited about that. But that's actually not, not really a bad use case in the sense that it shows a, use, a, a, a class of use cases that are around uh, digital scarcity, which is great. I believe there are better applications to that, and that's just like an example. But I think we, we, we just got to wait and see. Well, I'm, I'm interested in any type of system where a blockchain protocol enables trust minimization. So like the reason why money was such a big hit was because you know, money is basically controlled by central banks and governments and you know, a small number of people eh, probably can't really trust them. So there's so many other examples of, of um, you know, truthful records where we are trusting third parties. Uh, that especially comes into play with like property ownership. Uh, you know, generally various government entities are the ones that sign off and say, yes, you own this land, you own this house, you own this car, what have you. And uh, in, you know, in the United States, that probably works out pretty well. In a lot of countries, there's so much corruption or, or just, um, volatile governments with turnover and, and loss of records and whatnot, that just having a, a database and an audit log, if you will, that is incorruptible by any single entity provides a lot of value. So you, know, you, you no longer have to worry about uh, the, the data practices and uh, general trustworthiness of some bureaucrats that, that are sitting inside of an office. And in fact, that's a really great way that um, I've, I've heard of these protocols described as a way of, of automating bureaucracy. I like that. Automating bureaucracy sounds good. Um, I would agree with Guy. I, uh, I'm not super excited about a lot in the application realm as much as I am. Uh, from our own work, I would say what's exciting is really around how do you help large enterprises really tinker around and, and experience what the future might look like and be able to start asking themselves the right questions about where uh, their businesses are going to change and a lot of their processes are going to change because of these technologies. Um, and then I think, you know, things that excite me are, are tools like Definity. I think we're going to see a lot more innovation in these core protocol level uh, areas, and that's going to drive, um, you know, it's sort of, it's two sides. We're, we need to see businesses and applications from a use case perspective get a little bit more mature, and then we also need to see the technology that's going to make those scalable. So, Definity would be one that I'm particularly excited about. Yeah. Feel so, free to name names of projects if you like them. I think we just heard CryptoKitties and Definity so far. <laughs> So yeah, I think uh, currently we have uh, plenty of uh, applications 
that uh, are really cool prototypes or proof of concepts of what might be coming, uh, although we still don't have really mature applications uh, that are usable or that rely in uh, mature technology because we are still in early stages. So hopefully we will be uh, uh, witnessing uh, the development of new frameworks that facilitates the development, um, some tools that enables uh, all the people and not only tech savvy people to interact with these tools and uh, hopefully some of the security issues uh, will be also uh, yeah, fixed or at least known by the community so we can start uh, doing real things from these really cool uh, applications we are seeing now that promise a uh, cooler, funnier, uh, better future. Okay. Yeah, that, that actually, that hits a lot on what I, I spoke about just an hour or so ago, that um, making blockchain protocols and making infrastructure is great, but in order to get to that next level, we have to build tools that actually push for this like a cultural shift. Um, because the, the users, if they're going to be basically using private keys and, and managing data, uh, they're <laughs> going to need to have this new... Um, culture of responsibility built around that. So there's definitely a lot more to it than just uh, the technical side, and, and that's why I've actually found like the social aspects of these ecosystems to be so fascinating. I think that's a really good point. There's the old adage, uh, show me a technical problem and I'll show you a political one. And it's, I think, you know, to think about the usability and uh, how this is gonna integrate into existing infrastructure, existing systems is really important, um, and it's, a lot of it will rely on how we govern uh, shared technology infrastructure as well and how businesses and, and societies think about governing that kind of technology and using it uh, effectively. And so, so I think that, that's a good segue into um, the kind of the discussion around, so yes, like you have all these grander visions, so you, know, you talked about how Fortune 100 corporations could potentially like really better their processes, existing processes in many different verticals. Uh, in terms of like using this technology. Um, but that's probably what, like five to 10 years away. Uh, and in order to get there, like what do, you, what do you want the Jamesons of the world to be building in terms of the infrastructure to get there? And like, are, are there core technological pieces that are missing that you see today? Or is it just a matter of time that we will, the market will just take us there? I think it's a combination of tying, um, you know, sometimes we, we think about blockchain as a technical solution looking for a problem. I don't think that's totally true, but there are lots of problems in the world that exist and starting from them is a very useful place um, to start. So looking at ones that actually do require, um, you know, mitigation of uncertainty or a collaboration across non-trusting players, those kinds of things are really important starting points. And then really within a lot of enterprises, you do find that, you know, they are already collaborating, um, just to fulfill regulatory requirements sometimes, and yet they are competitive. So there's a lot of different areas we can see, um, just opportunity, and I think what we're missing are then, you know, those co more conversation probably, and we engage in it certainly at our firm, uh, bringing in awesome partners who are both from the technical side as well as from, um, you know, economics and thinking about just sort of the decision-making aspects, the governance, the social sides, what kind of incentives you're creating, those kinds of things are, are just as important as those technology conver conversations. Uh, so Antonia, I think you mentioned as well, you know, your, your, I guess your research is also kind of centered around the potential use of this for communities and, uh, you know, like, and then the economic structures, I guess, around the smaller communities as well. Yeah. Um, so like, where, where, where do you see from your perspective? Because, you know, we do want to see blockchains being used for social good, as, like for community side of you. Like, are we there yet? Like, what, what pieces do you want to see built? Uh, yeah, uh, we want to be uh, part of this building, so we want to, to build an infrastructure to help communities to choose governance models or value distribution models that work for other communities and adopt them in an easy uh, way. However, um, communities are, uh, um, are complex. Their, go their governance are always, uh, their governance mechanisms are always evolving and uh, they evolve from conflicts. So we have to see how uh, providing uh, some governance tools 
for these communities uh, might work in this complex uh, scenario, especially if these uh, rules are difficult to change. Because uh, in blockchain, what we have, uh, if we don't build upgradability of the governance, we will not be able to change. And then uh, there is a challenge of this uh, governance-based blockchain with what actually governs uh, communities like uh, free software communities or other open communities. So, yeah, we want to see the, <laughs> the ecosystem to evolve to allow for this flexibility and this readability. So, not really expert people could uh, probably in five, ten years choose some modules and uh, adopt them in their community, uh, hopefully uh, helping them. And uh, this is something we don't have now, but probably we will be seeing in, in some years. Cool. Awesome. I'm actually interested to see, because there's a great debate about should these protocols be more flexible and able to upgrade, or should they be resistant to change and resistant to coercion? Yeah. Uh, and this is one of those great ideological battles uh, that I don't think any of us have the answer to. Uh, we're just waiting to, to find out. Yeah, the thing is for the infrastructure probably we don't want these uh, protocols to be evolving, but with what we develop over the, the infrastructure, for instance, the governance of a cooperative uh, Airbnb could be more flexible, right? We are uh, dealing uh, in different levels of, uh, of abstraction or of the architecture. Yeah, that's true. I guess it also depends on this, what your application is. If you're managing a trillion dollar economy, you probably don't want to have things change overnight under, under your feet. Um, but I, I guess, yeah, it's like what application you're talking about as well. Um, but that's a good point. And um, guys, I think like you are, you know, you and your team's also building a pretty critical piece of like general blockchain adop adoption, which is like privacy. And that, I mean, privacy does tie into a surprisingly wide variety of applications in the blockchain space, like everything from money, which is obvious to, um, you know, it's a social good, really, like the ability for you to be private. And if we are moving a lot of our economy towards these systems, then it is important to preserve privacy, or at least the same level of privacy that we see in traditional markets. Yeah. Uh, so can you maybe talk a little bit about, about, about that specific piece of this technological building blocks and how, I guess, you see the future using the privacy? So, so I'll do this, uh, first of all, by analogy, and then I'll give, like, uh, I think, an example application. So, you know, if we think about blockchain as this one big database or, you know, world computer or whatnot, uh, let, let's just, you know, think about AWS, right? If AWS, all the data on, on all AWS data centers were to be made public today, like, it would completely fail, right? It would, it would have no use right now. No company would use it, no application would use it, it would create chaos. So, at the same, same level, right, blockchains need the same level of privacy, right? We need to be able to hide the actual data that we're storing on the blockchain, the actual data that we're computing over on the blockchain from everyone basically in the world because blockchains are open. Even in uh, private blockchains, you know, you want to you wanna hide your data from different entities that are coming together to do whatever social application or business application or objective they're trying to achieve. Um, and, you know, let me, let me tie that to an example. I think one example that I'm personally very excited about, I think healthcare and medical data along, or, you know, personal medical data, that could, could be one of the most amazing applications on the blockchain. Uh, so if you think about, you know, genomic data, the problem is that this is a very sensitive and personal data. It doesn't make sense for one entity to hold all of our genomic data. None of us would feel comfortable or want that. So a blockchain really creates this neutral ground where everyone's genomic data could just live in. The problem is, again, privacy, right? If you put your genomic data on the blockchain today, and again, I'm putting scalability aside for a second, if you put it on the blockchain today, it's there for everyone to see, so you don't really control it. But if you had a system that really allows you to kind of pull your data in a neutral, kind of like distributed network or blockchain-like environment, right, and then it would allow researchers to just run like computations, run research on the data uh, in a privacy-preserving way that doesn't leak your information, well, you would feel more comfortable. That would be better for science. And, you know, another added benefit of blockchain is that maybe you can even get paid for that. So I think that could be good all around. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple of different issues with privacy. So first of all, I mean, a blockchain is just a database. And it's, a, it's actually one of the worst databases that I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, it's incredibly inefficient. Um, I don't know why you would want to store uh, any like arbitrary data in a blockchain when you know, MySQL or Mongo or any of the other like, production scale databases out there are going to be much more optimized for storing and retrieving it. So with regard to privacy on a blockchain, because a blockchain, if it's set up correctly, is quote unquote immutable or at least t tamper or evident, then anything you put in there is going to be in there for potentially the rest of human history. So. Your, your options are to either come up with some extreme, extremely exotic uh, cryptographic protocols that, that encrypt the data so that only certain people can, can decrypt it and actually see it, or just don't put it in the blockchain in the first place. And you know, instead, you just take a fingerprint of the data and put that in the blockchain, and that acts as your proof. You can then store the data wherever you want in a secure fashion, and then refer to the blockchain uh, as a proof of existence, uh, basically you know, audit log, time stamping, what have you. Much more efficient to do it that way. The only real problem that comes into play is that some of these blockchains will have specific pieces of data in the system that is critical to the integrity of the system itself, that is you know, part of the consensus of the protocol. So, uh, in Bitcoin, for example, or most of the cryptocurrencies, that's going to be like the values of the transactions. And you want to make sure nobody is creating money out of thin air, so that data has to be in the blockchain. That's why we see stuff like Monero and Zcash, which are using fairly exotic uh, cryptographic algorithms to, to hide it, but the result is that you end up with a lot of bloat, uh, a lot of inefficiency, and it's an even less scalable type of blockchain protocol than something like Bitcoin. So um, in general, yeah, avoid putting data in the blockchain. Um, just put, think of the blockchain instead as a, a, a timestamp log and, and think of it as a proof uh, system so that you can, you can be a lot more flexible about your actual data storage. Yeah, that, that actually reminds me, I think the finance industry says blockchain is the technology behind Bitcoin. I think the Bitcoin people say blockchain is the cost Bitcoin pays to make itself work. It's a different cost-benefit analysis there. Um, so, so I guess, uh, Bettina, you have been, um, I guess, in, invested in the space as well. So you're kind of putting your money where your mouth is. Uh, what kinds of companies do you want to see emerge in the space over, you know, the, let's say the medium term, just so we don't want to take a too long view? I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for, I mean, some of it's kind of basic sounding, but a lot of the processes across, so I'm heavily supply chain focused, so I will caveat my answer with that at first. Um, a lot of the things we're excited about are, are just different process automation that you can build on top of these kinds of um, shared infrastructure. So even thinking about some of the basic things that happen in a supply chain, um, just contracts across different uh, existing parties. There's a lot of space for those kinds of innovations. I think people like to move towards areas that are maybe less or more glamorous than that, but there's still a lot of room just to be tinkered around in how do you think about um, processes differently using new technologies. Uh, and as I would also say there's specific concerns in some industries around things like um, their resiliency and the kinds of architectures they're already using. How do you create, um, you know, a, a mechanism for governing their own data that is, in their minds, more? Um, uh, I don't even. We work primarily on federated chains, so I would argue there's the consortium model that is gaining a lot of traction around how do different companies just think about their business in that architecture. Um, so to me, that's just a lot of the space for the innovation. Um, yes, I think I, I do want to leave some time for, uh, uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, so, so before we wrap up, I would like to know, um, so not, not to put anyone on the spot here, but let's just want to know the panelists' opinion on if, if you have to name like one non-money blockchain application that you want to see built in the next 10 years. I'll let anyone with the first idea go first. 
Twitter. Okay, that's a good one. I, I, I want a censorship resistant Twitter. Okay. Can, can you carry over your followers to that censorship resistant Twitter? No, no, but, but uh, you know, I'll have to rely on, on network effects. But uh, no, I mean, the, there are so many, I guess, different forms of uh, uh, social networks and uh, weird, weird just like social dynamics and phenomena going on on the internet right now that we can't really be sure what it is that these providers are doing with the data. You know, there's the whole Russia thing, uh, various manipulation going on. Uh, I think it would be more interesting if these type of systems were more open so that we could actually see what's going on. Um, I, I suspect that if the actual data behind social networks were open protocols and, and open blockchains or distributed ledgers or what have you, where more people could actually inspect them and do analytics on them, then we would see more interesting revelations and insights at a faster pace. Uh, a, a good example, I think, is you know some of the stuff that you see come out of uh, 4chan and Reddit, where it's sort of like crowd investigation, like mass investigation of, of open data sets. Can, can result in some very interesting finds uh, a lot faster than if it's a closed ecosystem where only a few people can inspect it. Cool. Uh, I mean, I, I'd say it again. I think data marketplace for researchers to improve science. Um, I would say any place where you're gonna see robots with wallets, I think that's a really cool area that there still hasn't been as much innovation as, as we could even do today, just in experiments. Uh, that's in part because we're already seeing 3D printing and a lot of different smart machinery enter our supply chains and there's not a lot of governance around how they're gonna transact. Okay, so I will uh, say the an interoperable network uh, of uh, reputation for um, those people collaborating and contributing to collaborative projects to have their work recognized and to be able to interoperate with this uh, value that uh, uh, important communities have recognized to them. Okay, cool. Um, yes, I think we have around six minutes left and I do wanna open the panel up for any audience questions. Go ahead, can you shout or? Yeah, I'll try it out if it works, otherwise just shout it out. Is that, okay, yep. So uh, we talked a little bit about uh, you know, needing to make a cultural shift to support new technologies in this space. We've also talked about uh, how this is great because it takes uh, the trust away from a few individuals and puts the, hand, you know, the trust in the hands of, of, uh, of many, I guess, or uh, depending on how you think about it, I guess we could talk about that for hours. Um, but, you know, I guess what my question for the panel is, how do we act as examples for the public uh, so that we can develop trust towards that push? You know, like as people that are meeting together kind of at the, the forefront of these new technologies and being on things like Twitter and social media, um, how, do, how can we act so that our behavior can um, build trust for the general public to adopt these technologies? Crack down on IC thousand. Um, oh. well, <laughs> I mean, hey, it might not be popular, but the reality is it's, yeah. it deflects a lot of attention from areas where there's real research happening or where there's real innovation. And I think, you know, we need a lot more of the news cycle focused on how you educate people and, and offer diverse opinion rather than, um, you know, just pump and dump schemes. From a, a, I guess, a more negative standpoint, I think one of the ideas behind these systems is how robust they are. So as long as the systems continue to operate uh, reliably, then all we have to do is point out the failures in the existing systems and show how, you know, if, if this was in a, a robust open protocol, this specific thing would not have been possible. But, but that's kind of the issue with any new technology, right, is it's, it's, a, it's a matter of time of having to build up its own reputation for reliability. Like very few people are gonna adopt a new technology early on that hasn't been proven. But um, that's why I don't see this 
as, you know, as fast-paced as technology is innovating and being adopted today, I still see this particular type of ecosystem as a multi-generational thing. Like, we, we really are rewriting how we build our own history. Uh, history of, of potentially anything. You know, first it's the history of money, but now it's the history of anything of value that we want to prevent from being corrupted and tampered with. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Go ahead. Hello. Cool. Hey, uh, thank you for the panel. It was pretty cool. Uh, I wanted to, uh, well, I've been thinking about layer one uh, kind of protocol things for a while. And it's, uh, you know, watching, also watching kind of the space mature and, uh, you know, talented people working on cool things. Um, it's, it's kind of hard for me to be excited about um, kind of these layer one protocols uh, to the point, I, I kind of think where if you're a layer one kind of thing and you have a token, you know, I immediately, you know, I just can't be into that thing. And I kind of, I'll analogize it to, well, there's two, there's two analogies and bear with me, it might be a little bit of a question, but, um, you know, I'd compare these kind of things to like the intranets of the world. It's like, why would anybody want to use your own network, whoever you are, like AOL, but like t of today? Like, you know, there's a rate limit on that network effect, first of all, and it's like, there's a little bit of like kind of selfish manifestation and being like, I'm going to do this you know, world-changing protocol with a token that I'm gonna trade on, whatever. And like that goes into, you know, you can say what you will about VC, but the cool thing about kind of VC-funded companies traditionally is like the incentives are aligned, right? Like let's assume humans are just monkeys and they want their thing, right? That's just an assumption I'm making, right? And I'm, I'm like Apple and I just IPO'd and I, I really want my stock price to go up. The direct, the direct actions I have to take to kind of get that to happen, it's that's like that's in line, right? So I have to like hire people, ship product, do things that make me very valuable. Whereas, and like this is kind of where I kind of can say I have some experience and some knowledge. If I'm a token and I want my token price, my coin price to increase, the direct actions I have to take in order to increase my coin price are like I'd almost say completely decoupled from like the actual adding of value to your product or company. If you wanna, and this is like a kind of get your coin price up 101, you wanna be like talking to the right market makers, talking to the right like kind of quote, maybe I'll even call it maybe predatory funds, uh, you know, getting listed on the right exchanges, going out to drinks with the right people that make the right decisions, or right, get enough people. To, so those things aren't in line with like add, actually adding value. So, you know, to me, like, as soon as you have, like, you know, and I admire kind of, like, interledger-like things or things that kind of don't really make you money directly. Like, fat protocols to me is kind of, like, this diluted idea. Everyone's like, oh, fat protocols. But, like, the reason that doesn't work is because it, it warps all the incentives, right? So, uh, I just, you know, that's just how I think about things. And because of that, it's hard to be excited about things. Yo, shout out to my homie, Eric Pinos. The question, the question is, the question is, Eric, I thought, I thought you were just throwing support. It's all good. Uh, the question is, I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. That's just how I think about things. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the, the free market will provide the answers to all of the pump and dump scams. I mean, a lot of people are going to get wrecked, and it's going to hurt, and that's, that's how they learn. Um, yeah, my favorite are the quote unquote utility tokens where we're gonna create an ecosystem for people who want to trade sneakers. But in order to trade sneakers, you have to use our token. Uh, like, yeah, we have something, it's called money, uh, it's called cryptocurrency. It's like, if you're just exchanging value, I don't need a like highly restricted token that only allows me to interact in this one little particular ecosystem. So, you know, I think a lot of those are probably not gonna do very well over the long run. You, you really need to be building some sort of unique protocol that, um, can only be used by your token. Like, the, 
it would be hard for someone to replicate. So that's why the, the result of a permissionless system where anybody can copy and paste code and, and just create uh, an ecosystem with a, a tiny amount of technical ability is that we have a ton of them. I, I can't even keep track of all of them anymore. And um, neither can I think anybody do the due diligence required to determine what the value of these things might be. So uh, that's why we, we, we just have people throwing money against the wall and seeing what sticks. And uh, in the end, a lot of people are, are gonna get hurt. And then, you know, unfortunately, we're then probably gonna have people go complain to the governments and the regulators and say, oh, we need you to come in and protect us all from these people who are just creating valueless systems and pumping them with their marketing. So hopefully it doesn't go that way, but I mean, I suspect that's what's gonna happen. Do you think that's like all systems kind of right now? That was a good nod, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the problem is that it's, it's so much easier to create a, a valueless system that you are marketing heavily as like the next big thing. Um, that's why these, these like multi-coin capital hedge funds, uh, it's very, I would like to know more like what they're actually doing with their due diligence to decide that one is worth more than another. But I think that a lot of it really comes down to the team. It's not so much the idea, like anybody can write a, white paper that has an idea, uh, that doesn't mean that they're going to actually be able to execute on it. It doesn't mean they're actually gonna be able to uh, overcome the sort of chicken and egg network effect problem. You know, Building a viral network is not easy. Cool, thanks. I think that's about all the time we have for this panel. Well, I thank the panelists. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion. <laughs>